Good to see all of you this morning. Those of you that have been here know we're in the book of Zechariah, and some of you may think we're moving a little slow. And I say that to myself. And God gave me a couple of examples, which I believe it was from the Holy Spirit. One was, the first one, uh, Alistair Begg is one of the pastors that we follow and hear on TV. He's just finished the book of Jude, which is one chapter, 25 verses, 11 sermons. That's two verses a sermon. Now, I, I'm not a preacher, I don't preach a sermon, but that's moving pretty slow. But it's not all that slow. Another example that I was given, Tony and I years ago went to Lakewood Baptist Church, and there was a visiting pa pastor from Scotland there, and you know the Scottish are so smart because they just sound smart when they speak. Anyway, this guy, pastor preached a sermon from Psalms, three words, part of the verse. Deep calls unto deep. 45 minutes, everybody was spelled out. And the third example I'll give you that has nothing to do with the first two. Uh, we were in a church at Red Hill where we went when Tony was first saved. And not too far down the line, this pastor we had, which we liked a lot, he was pounding the pulpit, and Tony says, why is he pounding the pulpit? He isn't saying anything. You might be able to identify with some pastors that do that. They don't have anything to say, they just pound the pulpit. I'll try not to do that. <laughs> if I start doing that, you will know I have nothing to say. Okay, we're back in Zechariah, and we're in chapter 6, trying to finish that. And uh, we're going to start in verse 12 of chapter 6. The Lord will build a temple. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying. Now, He's talking to the angel who is talking to uh, Zechariah when he says this, so you know. Behold the man whose name is the branch. For his place he, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now the first thing let me ask you is what is a temple or what is a church? I'm going to kind of put those two together. Uh, when I was a young guy, and you may have done this too, I hope I can do this with my hands, they taught us this. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open it up and there's the people. The temple and the church are all about the people, it's not the building or anything else. So I was reminded of that. So my second question is, who is the Lord and what is his name? Well, there are over a hundred names, well over a hundred names for God in Scripture that describes his attributes and his works. The one here is the branch. And it and describes his beginning here on earth and one of his mighty works. He was a root out of dry ground, we read in Isaiah. And he came to earth in poverty, that's a description of that, and became not just a branch, but the branch in the line of David. So he went from abject poverty, from the royalty he had in heaven, to the line of David, which he will eventually become the king of kings and lord of lords. Now, he became poor, though, while he was here, so he could make us rich. If you read Ephesians chapter 2, it'd be great for your prayer life. It gives us all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus, and they are incredible. You read through those, and you can just stop and pray on each one of them. It's just an incredible thing. 
It also says he shall branch out from his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Jesus is coming as the branch the next time he comes and he will rule the world. This has was given as an encouragement to the remnant in their struggle to rebuild the temple. There, when they had come back from Babylon, their job was to rebuild the temple so they could worship there. And Haggai, the prophet, saw that the people thought it looked small and insignificant. Of course, they were comparing it to Solomon's temple. But in God's eyes, it was one house. Although there is a series of temples, I've never really put them together before, let's count them. There was a wilderness tabernacle, Solomon's temple, the great tribulation temple, which is to come, and the millennial temple, which will be way out there in the future. And he calls it one house. And they, all, <clears throat> and they were all important to God when Jesus cleansed the temple, remember? When the money changers were in there and doing all this stuff, he went in there and took out a whip and he ran them all out of the temple. And he said, this is a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves. Today the church is made up as one house also, although it is made up of many churches small, medium, large. You know the average church in America is 65 people. I, can't, I grew up in one of those churches and we hardly ever got to 65. They'd post the attendance and the offering on the wall in the back. I think I would have turned it over because sometimes it was 25 and the offering was very small, but they did. But there's also what we call mega churches, have an average attendance of 2,000 to 10,000. All are one church in God's sight. And I will say one exception, there are false churches out there that teach a false gospel. There are those that preach a prosperity gospel and there's churches that don't preach any gospel at all. But all the rest are one worldwide church. And that is all those that are saved from Pentecost all the way up to the rapture of the church was just taken out of the world. And if you go to the book of Revelation, it says there were too many to count when they got there. Of all tribes and tongues and nations of the world, too many to count. You know, I, my mom, who taught me the Bible, my dad was farming, and she knew the Bible backwards and forwards, and so she was a Southern Baptist, and she thought that was the only true religion. Even the other, even the Northern Baptists, or the other Baptists, she thought there was only one true faith, and it was Southern Baptist. And so, one day I introduced her to Dr. J. Vernon McGee. And I told her what channel to listen to him on on the radio. She loved the guy. And after she had listened to him for a while, I said, Mom, he's Presbyterian. <laughs> what? <laughs> he can't be. I said, yeah, he was. OK. I went to, Tony and I went to a Gaither concert well, many, many years ago. And it was incredible. And as I looked around this crowds of thousands of every denomination and faith there, and they were all singing glory to God and they were all praising God together. And I thought, this is what heaven will be like. Christ will reign as both king and priest, verses 13 and 14. Yes, he will build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and he shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of, 
and the council of peace shall be between them both. It says again, he is the sprout, the branch, who grew out of poverty and obscurity, shall build the temple of the Lord. And this one, this time, refers to the millennial temple. And he shall rule upon his throne as both king and priest. You know, a priest never ascended the throne. God always kept those two offices separate, except when it come to Jesus. In fact, he had all three offices, prophet, priest, and king. But these two offices will be combined into one person, and the crown shall be for a memorial in the temple. Remember they did a symbolic crowning of the high priest, Joshua. That was only symbolic because he was not going to be a king. He did not really wear those crowns. They were placed upon his head only for symbolic purposes. Only the Messiah could wear both crowns. Verse 15, many nations will come and participate in the future temple in verse 15. Even those from afar shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey, diligently obey the voice of the Lord. Let me say this. God is referring to the future millennial temple I want to read just a quick passage out of Isaiah 2.2. 2. And this is referring to the time of the millennium. It says this, Now it shall come to pass in latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain, and it shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, I'm not going to go any further with that. I'm going to go, and you may say, it said back in verses 13 and 14, it says, the Lord will build the temple. Now, this is key. The Lord works in concert with his people. Almost always. He seldom does anything alone. Philippians 2, 12 illustrates that. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, but... It is he that is working in you, both to his good works and his will. Isaiah 56, 6 and 7, I want to read as well. It says this, Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him, these are Gentiles, and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenants. And Jesus cleansed the temple. He said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Do you know, every time the Bible refers to the temple, he never calls it a place of worship. Isn't that what we call the church today, a place of worship? Always. The Bible always says it is a house of prayer. Isn't that interesting? But he said, you have made it a den of thieves. The last part of verse 15, I want to read again. It said, and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord. This does not mean the fulfillment of this prophecy depends upon their obedience, but their participation in it depends is upon their faith and obedience. That's what they, their, their faith is strengthened by that. God seldom works alone. He does his work through us and his holy angels. And he uses them a lot. He uses us a lot if we're willing to be used. They're always willing to be used. Remember when Gabriel said, when they said, where are you from? I stand in the presence of God, waiting to do his will. You know, <clears throat> I thought about this. You ever miss out on the blessings you could have received by participating in something? Now, 
I'm guilty of this as well as maybe some of you. Some of you do too much, but if we look at that and, and we usually use excuses like, that's not my gift. Or, I like what I'm doing. I don't want to expand that. I don't have enough time. But by engaging in that, you would be amazed at how much you can get out of that. I remember when Tony and I came to this church, they started a small group called 2-7. And at first I thought, you know, I'm teaching a class. I even did a home Bible study then. I don't need to go to this other group. But since Tom Jones, our youth pastor, was teaching it, and few people, we didn't know all that many people here yet, we decided to go, and that has stuck with us so much ever since. We've made friends there that will be friends for life. Now we come to what many theologians call an historic interlude. What is that, historical interlude? Well, they have that in the Psalms. You know that word Sheila that comes in every now and then? You know what that means? It means stop and think. Stop and meditate. You just heard something, you need to just stop and listen. Well, both chapters seven and eight is an historic interlude, which means he stops the subject he's on and he changes his tune altogether, then he goes back. Because here's something important in these two chapters he wants us to get. In the prophecy of Haggai, he went to the priest and he said this. This is going to be an illustration of what he's going to demonstrate to us. He said, if you take, well, I'll just take a glass of water and pour it into a glass of dirty water, what do you get? Dirty water. You plas take a glass of dirty water, you put it into clean water, what do you get? Dirty water. This is kind of similar to what they're going to experience here. In this section of Zechariah, we have the same problem approached from a little different angle. A delegation of men are sent to Jerusalem. Chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Now, the, in the fourth year of the of King Darius, the reign of King Darius, it came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month. Chisla, that's what they call it in Hebrew. When the people sent Sherezer with Regan Malek and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord. These men came from Bethel, which means house of God. However, Bethel was located in the northern kingdom, which was separated from the southern kingdom. If you remember back after Solomon was, uh, had died, he, the, there were one son initially that took over his place. And then there was another rebel son that didn't like what the other son was doing. So he took the 10 tribes into the northern kingdom and there was a tribe of Judah and Benjamin in the southern kingdom. And it was, he took it down badly. Jer Jeroboam, one of the sons of Solomon, put one of the golden calves to be worshiped. Commandment number one is what? Thou shall have no other gods before me. You wouldn't have thought he would have just not remembered number one. These men were most likely from the tribe of Ephraim. The northern kingdom was called Ephraim and the southern kingdom was called Judah. And the book of Ezra told us that all 10 tribes were represented in the return to Israel. Remember that? We, many people today, say they're the 10 lost tribes. Well, God didn't lose them. Remember, they were taken in captivity into Syria in the northern kingdom 150 years before the southern kingdom. But guess what happened? Babylon overtook Assyria and they were assimilated into Babylon. So where did the southern kingdom end up? They ended up in Babylon. So there's a mixture of all those tribes there in Babylon. So some of each tribe actually returned. These men come to Jerusalem with questions. Number three, verse three, 
and to ask the priest who were in the house of the Lord of hosts, and the prophet saying, Should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for so many years? So the question is, is the ritual right or wrong? The people had been begun to fast before the Babylonian captivity and had continued to do so during the Babylonian captivity. In fact, remember Psalms 137 verses 1 and 2 says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. And on the willows we hung our harps. They cried through their souls, and that became a religious function. You know, some, so many rituals come out of an experience rather than from the Word of God. If you go to an experience, you can go to anything. Everybody experiences something, and it's usually, many times, not good. So everything you do should start with the Word of God. Here's the truth. God had never given them fast days. He gave them seven feast days. It was their own idea to fast. They had set aside days of fasting and days of weeping and mourning during the captivity, and they continued it after the captivity. But God was not blessing them. The question here is the right or wrong of our ritual. Well, let me start out by saying there's a lot of ritualism in religions. I'll just take one, the Catholic faith. They're full of rituals. Some of those are good, but some of them came out of Babylon. They're just rituals that they hung on to and drug them into their faith. Now, don't get me wrong. I think versus a lot of people, there would be a lot of Catholics in heaven because they preach the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation. Now, they add a lot of other stuff in, but I think God still captures that and rewards that. But I can tell you that there's so much rituals in there, and formalism. Usually rituals and formalism is always in evidence when people cease to think and get away from God's Word. If they start thinking outside of God's Word, where's that going to lead? Well, the devil's going to take control of that thinking. I just read recently that young people are leaving the church in droves because they don't like what they teach. Well, I'll say this. Dr. J. Vernon McGee said something about that. If you don't like what God's doing here, you just start your own universe. <laughs> and you can have any religion you want. Now I'm gonna change my tune just a little bit because God gave to the nation Israel a religion and it is the only religion he ever gave. Christianity grew out of that and it was ritualistic to the core. You read about the priests and all of the stuff they did, it was ritualistic. So is a ritual right or wrong? That is the question of the group. They said, we've been fasting and weeping and wailing and it looks pretty silly now. And, by the way, it's very boring. You ever known religion to be boring? Well, you get a bad pastor and it's very boring. After all, it was a religious rite and we're going through and we're not getting any results. God is not blessing us. Should we keep on doing this? Well, should you keep on doing anything that God's not blessing? I see a lot of groups different things that start in churches and they start off with a bang and they dwindle down to two or three people and they keep on and on and go on. Should they keep doing it? I don't think so. We will find that there is a threefold answer to this question concerning a religious ritual. First, the first answer is that when the heart is right, 
the ritual is right. That's in verses four through seven. Secondly, the second answer is that when the heart is wrong, the ritual is wrong. That'll be in verses eight through 14. And thirdly, is found in chapter eight, so we, we're not gonna get into that today. God's purpose concerning Jerusalem is unchanged by any religion. And his purpose for the church is not changed by any religion. His purpose is going to be carried out. That will answer a great many people today who say, let's do this or that or pray to hasten the return of the Lord. It's so bad here, let's just try to hasten the return. You can't hasten the return of the Lord for even one second by anything you do. He's running this universe on his timetable. You know, Elon Musk, whether you like him or not, probably one of the smartest guys in the world. He certainly built an empire, the richest man in the world. He claims to know the Bible. He was raised in a church and he loves the teachings of Jesus. But here's what he says. He thinks we will need to build colonies on Mars in the future to continue our existence. So he built SpaceX and that's his goal is to build colonies on Mars. You know, here's a very smart man that don't get it. When the heart is right, the ritual is right. Verses four and five. I think we're in chapter seven. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, say to all the people of the land and to the priest, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during these 70 years, did you really fast for me? And he repeats it in this Bible, for me, for me, he's doing that for emphasis. God said to them, when you went through your ritual, did you do it for me? Or did you do it for a legalistic exercise to put something in the plus column? So I would bless you. God did not approve or disapprove of the ritual. That's what it says here. He inquires into our motives. I think, as I said before, rituals can become very boring. Now, some people are very exciting to God, but I'm talking about to God, they can become bored. Reminds me of the story, and you've probably heard this before, of the little girl when her mom uh, was sending her up to bed, and she said, now be sure to, quote, remember your prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep, now you know the prayer that she was supposed to pray. And her mom comes up afterwards and said, did you pray your prayers? She said, I did, but I did a little different prayer. I just told him the story of the three bears. <laughs> I think God listened. <laughs> that wasn't boring. Are we doing all for the glory of the Lord in verse six? When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? God says, you didn't fast unto me. And when the fasting was over, you couldn't wait to get to the table. You're pretty hungry. And when you're eating, did you do it unto me? And Paul wrote this. Let me finish verse 7. I should have included it. Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the lowland were inhabited. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 8.8, 8, talking about whatever we do is for the glory of the Lord. It says, first of all, Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 8.8, 8, but food does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat are, the be are we the better, or do we not eat, are we the worse? Now, some people, 
now I believe you should pray before you eat and thank God, but some people make it a spectacle. I don't know if you've gone into a restaurant, you know, see people holding hands and they pray a long prayer while somebody's waiting to wait on them. I don't think that that's what you ought to do. You, you can pray silently or you can pray in a group and just bow your heads. You don't need to make a spectacle out of it. But let's go to 1 Corinthians 10.31 and what Paul says. And this is key. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That says it all. If you fast to the glory of God, go ahead and fast. But let me say this, there was no command to fast or not fast in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. None. God left that up to us to choose, but we're to choose from the heart. There's only one command, and that is this. Be sure you're right, be sure your heart is right before God. That's it. So why did Jesus fast? That's a fascinating subject. Any of you ever study that? Why did he fast? Well, some people think that because he fasted, they should follow in his tracks. And there are those, and I'm not against this because I've been criticized for it, but that's where Lent came out of, fasting for 40 days, and if people get something out of it. I'm not against it, but they think they should follow in the steps of Jesus when he fasted in the wilderness. And that's not what it says here. It says, first of all, let me say this, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. He didn't choose to go. The devil didn't take him there griping and moaning and groaning. And I read a lot about this because I wanted to know why Jesus fasted. And I'll, I read all of the scholastic theologians. I came upon one, R.C. Sproul. You've probably heard of him. He was a theologian. In fact, he was John MacArthur's best friend. Here's what he said. He was entering into the territory Satan had occupied. He fasted for 40 days, and his humanity was inconceivably weak. So out of the depth of his weakness, he might overcome the power of the evil one. In other words, when he was in his weakest condition, he created him, by the way, and he created him as the most powerful and the most beautiful of all his creation. In his weakest point, he could conquer Satan. Not as an example for us to follow, but to show that in his total weak condition, he was able to overcome the most powerful being that was ever created. Okay, the commandments of God, verses 8 through 10. Check my watch. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. What does that sound like to you? Micah 6, 8, which we sing a song about. It's very, very similar. Here. The first four commandments has to do with man's relationship to God, we know. Then there's a bridge to the last six or five. The bridge, there's really two bridges. The first one is to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And the other one is obey your father and mother in the Lord and you'll have long days on the earth. It's the only one with a promise. And it, the reason God gave that is that we look up to our parents as God when we're growing up. 
And then when we are grown up, we can look easier to God as in charge. I think that's why he gave it that way. But the rest of the commandments are all filled with thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. All eight of the rest of them, that's what they say. Let me get back to the subject here. The reason for that is, again, uh, we'll obey the Lord. God is saying, <clears throat> although Israel went through the rituals, you ought to have observed them not only on the Sabbath, but on Sunday through Friday. By the way, their Sabbath started at 6 o'clock Friday night. You know, I didn't really realize that till we went to Israel. Everything shut down on Friday night at 6 o'clock. That's when you start to celebrate here, Friday night at 6 o'clock. Everything shuts down there. But, you know, some of us go to church on Sunday and live like the devil Monday through Saturday. We know people like that. And some fast on Friday. They don't eat any meat on Friday, but they eat fish. I thought that was meat, but... The Israelites, he said, on Friday evening, you went through the rituals. Again, you weep and mourn and bring sacrifices. The prophet Malachi said this. You said that those sacrifices made you sick. You ought to have been in my position. God says they nauseated me. One last story and we'll go. <clears throat> Growing up, I grew up in this small Baptist church in Bell, California, which had 600 in population, so the church was small. And my pastor, my, the pastor was my oldest brother. And there was this, not old lady, fairly young lady, he gave an invitation up front every time, every service. You remember those, some of those, they walked down the aisle. But there was two invitations that always were given. One was, do you want to accept Christ? The other was, what? Do you want to rededicate your life, right? And more people came down for that than the other, because most of the people there were saved. But this one lady who was probably in her late 30s, early 40s, Every Sunday, when he gave the invitation, she came down. Week after week after week. And I thought, my brother should tell her. <laughs> she shouldn't come down. I even asked him about it one time. But she always has something to confess. But she comes back the next week and the next week. And don't you think everybody else is going to say, what on earth is this? And guess what God thinks of that? That's a little boring, seeing her walk down the aisle every week to rededicate her life. Change your life out of one event of those coming down the aisle. That's all, folks. Let's sing our song. <laughs> Jack, lead us in our song.